Hey, what's up, everybody? Dorn Aldana here, coming at you with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. And today we're going to talk about why mortgage pros fail and fall way short of their full potential. You know, I've been in this game 15 years. I've seen so many cases where mortgage professionals have all kinds of exquisite talent, capability, ability. They got big dreams, big goals. They're all bright eyed, bushy tailed, full of vim and vigor, ready to go and conquer their dreams. And yet somewhere along the way, they fall short. Somewhere along the way, they get stuck in the muck and mire of mediocrity, struggling just to eke out a meager existence in this business, or they do relatively well. That's another scenario where they do relatively well. Maybe they get themselves to a plateau where they're making 150K or 200K or 300K a year, and then they stagnate. They get comfortable, they get complacent, they start to drift. And next thing you know, they're in a rut. And I once heard that the definition for a rut is a grave with the two ends knocked out because a rut leads to rot. Stagnation leads to death. It leads to a sense of not being fulfilled, not being happy in life. Because where we feel happy as human beings is when we're growing, when we're expanding, when we're moving upwards in progress. It isn't necessarily about getting the bank account to a certain level, although that might be an indicator of growth. It's a sense of progress that has us feel fulfilled, that has us feel the sense of excitement and fulfillment in life. And so stagnation breeds rot. I live next to a river and I'm literally right on the river. I have a berm that keeps the river from overflowing into my yard. And right next to that berm, there's actually a man-made island. And there's all kinds of sporting parks, baseball, uh, soccer, and so on there. And around that island, there is a slough. Now, in the slough, the river doesn't have any room to move. It stagnates. So you have this fresh, vital river water that flows into the slough. And because it's pinched into a narrow area, it slows down and it doesn't have circulation of fresh water. And then you've got all the ducks pooping in the water and it stagnates and it breeds all kinds of nasty. There's big signs up that say, do not swim in the slough. Why do you think that is? It's because that water has become tainted due to stagnation. That water is rotten water. It's not healthy. The same goes in our own lives. When we stagnate, when we get complacent and we start to get into a rut where we're doing the same old thing, getting the same old result, results, banging our head against the wall, spinning our wheels, feeling frustration, that stagnation, even if we're making great money, it's not fulfilling. It might be comfortable, but it's not fulfilling because fulfillment comes from growth, expansion, progress, not from a certain amount in the bank account. We need to feel like we're making a difference. We need to feel like we're learning and growing. We need to feel like we're expanding and conquering new mountains, not just sliding down old ones. True? So this is not just for people who are struggling to pay the bills. This is also for people who've been in the business for a period of time and yet have stagnated and know they're capable of so much more, and yet they're not. Perhaps you have colleagues who are kicking ass, taking names, chewing, chewing, easy for me to say, chewing bubble gum and crushing it. And yet you look at yourself and you see yourself stagnating. And you think, why not me? Why can't I be in the limelight? Why can't I be kicking ass? Why can't I be expanding? At the end of the day, when you take your last breath, you want to feel the sense of satisfaction, the sense of gratification that you played full out, full on, you gave it your best, and you really stepped up and became the best version of yourself. You played full out so that at the end of your life, you can feel this sense of gratification, the satisfaction that you did it, that you made it happen, that you played full out and full on, and that you stepped into the greatness you're called to. 
That is what I call living to the fullest. That's a full life. And so what keeps us from living that full life, that life of fulfillment? I'm going to talk about a few of those things today. The first thing that keeps us from winning in life, winning in our business, the first thing that causes so many mortgage professionals to fail and fall way short of their full potential is thinking too small. You know, they'll often say, I want to be realistic. I want to be reasonable. I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. Or they might on the flip side say, I don't want to be greedy. Perhaps you can relate to that. Maybe you have friends or family members that if you read between the lines in what they say and how they say it, there's a sense of guilt that you're already making great money. Why would you go for more? Why would you work to move beyond what you're already making? You're already making 300K, 400K, half a million. Don't be greedy. You know, don't be greedy. You already have more than enough. And so all of that starts to corrode our sense of imagination and wonder for what's possible in our lives. And we start to put our dreams into a smaller little box. I've often said that the secret to a mediocre life is having small, reasonable, realistic goals. Because while they might be reasonable and realistic, they're not exciting. They're boring. And frankly, I've been prone to that myself. I mean, I've been in the game 15 years. It's easy when you've been in the game for a while to start to think small just because you don't know anything else but the history you have. And small might be big for other people. I'm not talking small or big based on some universal reference. I'm talking small or big based on your potential, based on what you know you're deep down in your heart you're capable of. This has nothing to do with other people. This has to do with you. This has to do with your dreams. This has to do with your potential. This has to do with tapping your gifts and talents to the utmost and to really play full on and full out. It's not that people are shooting too high and missing. It's that they're shooting too low and hitting. They're playing it safe. They're playing it small. And they're conforming to what they think other people would deem as reasonable and realistic because they don't want to be the crazy cat who has these big, crazy, audacious goals, who's just living in delusional optimism. They don't, they don't want to be labeled that crazy cat who is just, you know, in an, another world from another planet who doesn't have their feet on the ground. They want to be considered reasonable and realistic so they can belong, so they can belong to their tribe. The problem is if you want to belong to a tribe who's living a mediocre life, you end up being another mediocre life. At some point or another, you have to divorce yourself from the mediocre life and the mediocre thinking and marry yourself to being a renegade, marry yourself to being different, marry yourself to being audacious enough to be different and to bring people into your energy orbit and into your network and into your sphere of friends who think audacious big dreams and inspire you to do likewise. And at some point, there's going to be a break in rapport with people who aren't willing to come along. So be it. Let them live small lives, not you. Like the late and great Jim Rohn once said, let other people live small lives, but not you. Let other people have small ambitions, but not you. Let other people whine, snivel, and complain over small hurts, but not you. Let other, let other people live a mediocre life, but not you. You're destined and designed for greatness. You were made by greatness for greatness. So embrace that. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Embrace the fact that you're made to do something great, to put a dent in the universe, to make uh, impact in the world and to spread your wings and soar. So have big, hairy, audacious goals. Your goals should scare you and excite you at the same time. They should ignite you with a holy guacamole. This is a big goal. You want a big, hairy, audacious goal, a God-sized goal so that you need God to help you attain it and create it and manifest it. Because if it's just a small, itty-bitty goal, there's no energy to that. There's no juice to that. There's no excitement to that. There's no wonder in that. There's no fascination in that. It's just 
ho-hum, boring, paying the bills, doing okay, doing good. No, screw good. Let's divorce good. Let's go for great. Good is the mortal enemy of great. If you're doing good right now and you've been in stagnation, that chances are is the problem because you've been sitting on your laurels and being content with good instead of stretching for higher ground, going for great. Good is always the mortal enemy of great because it has you sucked into the vortex of your comfort zone, playing it safe, playing it small, sitting on your laurels and drifting instead of driving, settling instead of soaring and expanding and stretching. We were designed not to drift, not to settle, but to expand and grow and reach for higher ground. You want to conquer new mountains, not slide down old ones. So thinking too small is one of the big things that holds us back from greatness and the greatness we're called to. The other thing that causes us to fall short of our potential and causes many mortgage professionals to fail is, of course, lack of quality leads. Not all leads are created equal. You can have 100 leads from referrals from clients. Out of the 100 leads that come from top producing realtors, chances are you'll convert 30 to 50% of them. Out of the ones that come from Facebook or from Google AdWords, you, you're lucky if you're converting 3 to 5% of them. So not all leads are created equal. The problem with most mortgage professionals and what causes them to struggle and fall way short of their potential is they forget what business they're in. They don't realize what business they're truly in. They think they're in the mortgage business and that'll keep them broke and struggling and stagnation. You're not in the mortgage business. You're in the marketing business. You're in the success habit cultivation business. You're in the sales lead generation and lead conversion business. And until and unless you embrace that and operate your daily agenda in light of that, you're going to fall way short of your potential. You're in the lead generation, lead conversion business, my friends. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, that is the business you are in. The problem with most mortgage professionals is they get to a certain level of comfort in their business, closing one, two, three, four, five loans a month or whatever it happens to be. And then they get sucked in the vortex of having a practice, having a job, trading time for money, working in their business as opposed to on their business. And they don't truly have a real business. They have a practice because all they're doing is working in their business, pushing paper, doing paperwork, uh, doing all the administrative minutia tied to making sure these deals close and they don't fumble. The problem with that is you can easily get into this erroneous assumption that you're in the mortgage business because you're doing mortgages. And it's really easy to slip into that false sense of certainty that indeed you're in the mortgage business because that's what you're doing all day, doing mortgages. But what that's going to do is it's going to cause you to stagnate because you're not spending consistent time setting up systems, policy, protocol, and campaigns that generate more fresh blood, generate more fresh streams of quality leads into your business. So what happens is you get sucked into the vortex of dealing with loan level issues. And that's what you spend the majority of your day doing, being in reactionary mode, being reactive instead of proactive, drifting instead of driving, not spending any consistent proactive lead generation time on a daily basis. And then you wonder why your income is up and down like a yo-yo, right? Up one month, down the next. Up one month, down the next. I call it the roller coaster ride from hell. Right, because you're constantly worrying where that next deal is going to come from because your income is so inconsistent. Why is it inconsistent? Because you forgot what business you're truly in. You're in the lead generation business. The up and down roller coaster ride is caused by the root of the problem, which is not being consistent with lead generation and focusing on the lower quality leads instead of the higher quality leads. So often, Mortgage professionals will focus on doing ads on Facebook to the neglect of cultivating a stable of top producing realtors 
who make them their exclusive lender, to the neglect of putting referral systems in place to maximize repeat and referral business from the past clients. That's like stepping over dollars to pick up dimes. That just doesn't make sense. And yet we see that time and time again, mortgage professionals taking the path of least resistance, which is just paying money for some advertising, winging it, and dealing with a bunch of crap leads that don't convert instead of some really high quality leads with real high quality referral sources that actually convert. At the end of the day, you don't get paid on leads. You get paid on conversions. You get paid on funded volume. And often we lose sight of that. So not having systems in place to generate quality leads and quality referrals is a big reason why mortgage professionals struggle and why they fall way short of their potential. And it's because they forgot what business they're in. They're in the marketing business, not the mortgage business. The third thing that has mortgage professionals fall way short of their potential and has them fail is lack of solid partnerships. They have this erroneous assumption that realtors are a pain in the ass, that they're egotistical, that they're all prima donnas, that they're not worth you know, working with, that the juice is not worth the squeeze. And so because they have a bad taste in their mouth and they had a bad experience, they just throw the baby out with the bathwater. They say they're a pain in the ass, they're prima donnas, they're annoying, they're aggravating, they're flaky. I don't need them. And that's all fine and dandy and great. But what happens is because they throw the baby out with the bathwater, they start to step over dollars to pick up dimes and they start to go after consumer direct advertising, doing those methods I just talked about, Facebook ads, Google AdWords. There's nothing wrong with that. We get our clients to do it. We provide that service to our clients. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is their erroneous assumption that A, realtors are a pain in the ass. B, the top producers are harder to attract. C, all realtors want is to take, 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 and they're just going to treat you as a replaceable commodity. And all that is true if you're doing it the hard way. All that is true if you don't have a compelling, unique value proposition. All that is true if you're just a replaceable cog in the wheel. All that is true if you're just showing up like everyone else, offering great rates, great service, throw me a bone, and being a lone leech, a lone parasite, just sucking them for referrals. All that is true. So your experience is your truth based on you doing it the hard way. Those are all symptoms of you doing it the hard way. But that's like saying sex sucks just because you had a bad experience with sex. No, maybe you're just doing it the wrong way, right? <laughs> because if you're not enjoying sex, you're probably not doing it the right way. You're probably doing it the wrong way. Same thing with realtors. If you're not enjoying working with them, that's a symptom that you're doing it the wrong way. You're doing it the hard way. So it's about getting clarity on the fact that realtors are not the problem. How you're approaching them is the problem. And if you're not having a pleasant experience with them, if you're not enjoying the process of working with your stable of six to 12 rock star top producing agents who are sending you all the business all the time, then it's probably like sex. You're probably doing it wrong. And that's precisely why you want to master the game of attracting not the low producers, but the top producers attracting the top producers because it's an erroneous assumption that top producers are harder to attract. It is indeed true that you need to have the right words that work, the right value proposition. You need to have the right posture. You need to have the right certainty, clarity, and confidence. You need to be able to show up like a champion if you want to attract champions, just like in dating. If you want to attract the 10, you've got to be the 10. You can't show up as a five and then think that you're going to get and attract the tens. Us dudes watching right now, you got to be knowing if you're showing up like a scrub, you're not going to attract that beautiful 10 out of 10 bombshell lady in your life because you're not being who you need to be to attract that bombshell. Water seeks its own level. If you want to attract 10s, you got to be a 10. That's the part that hurts, right? Because oftentimes we want the 10s without being the 10. We want the maximums while doing the minimums. And that just doesn't work, friends. If you want the maximums, you got to play full on, full out and bring the maximums, bring your best and just show up in power and shine.
because those are the kind of people top producers want to work with. But Doran, they're all prima donnas. I don't want to work with them. They all think their shit don't stick. They all think that, you know, they're going to have it their way, way like it's Burger King. And that's just not the game I want to play. I get it. And that's a symptom of you doing it the hard way because you're showing up being interviewed instead of interviewing. You're showing up having them have the cookie instead of you having the cookie. You're showing up where you need them more than they need you. You're showing up such that they're in the power position. You're not in the power position. You're showing up hoping and praying that maybe they'll throw you a crumb, hoping and praying that maybe they'll give you the time of day. Screw freaking that. That's the wrong approach. It's the wrong posture. You want to set it up so that the realtor needs you more than you need them. You want to set it up so that you have the cookie, so that you become irreplaceable and indispensable. And they send you all their business all the time. They make you their exclusive. They put you on their speed dial. In order to do that, you need to have a mindset shift and you need to understand that the single most profitable activity you can ever do in your business is meeting with, attracting, and solidifying your relationship with top producing agents. You think about it, just one top producing agent who makes you their exclusive is easily worth 30 to 50K a year to you. Do the math. Any way you slice it or dice it, one top producer who sends you one deal a month that closes is easily worth 30 to 50K per year uh, or more, depending on how much your average commission per deal is. So then the pregnant question begging to be asked is how many of those VIP partners do you need or want to get to your income goal? I guarantee you it ain't 50. I guarantee you it ain't 100. I guarantee you it ain't 30. Chances are it's like probably five to 10, maybe 15 max. And this flies in the face of all these so-called experts out there telling you to cold call the same 40 freaking realtors every Monday, calling them with no value proposition, calling them without any unique value to bring to the table, just wearing them down through sheer persistence. They're not going to give you the time of day because they see you as a suck. They see you as someone who's trying to get something from them, not bring something to them. And that's the difference. You got to flip the script so that you're the bombshell. You got to flip the script so that they're looking at you thinking, dang, I love the privilege uh, and the pleasure of working with that rock star. That is a champion right there. That's the kind of rock star I want to work with. Look at the value they bring to the table exclusively for people who qualify. You want them to feel like they got interviewed and grilled to see if they might have what it takes to be one of your privileged VIP partners. Notice the difference in posture. Notice the difference in positioning. So the reason why you have a lack of solid partnerships is because you're doing it wrong, friends. It ain't because they're wrong. It's because you're doing it wrong. And once you thread the needle on what does work, once you thread the needle on getting back into the power position, getting in the driver's seat of your business and picking and choosing who you want to work with and only working with rock stars and cool cats you actually enjoy working with, it's a game changer. It changes everything and it changes everything in a hurry. The fourth thing that holds a lot of people back from their full potential and the piece of the puzzle that eludes so many mortgage professionals such that they get chewed up and spat out and have to go back to the day job nine to five with a nine to five glass ceiling over their head and a nine to five you know, office ball and chain around their ankle and living in nine to five prison, giving up on their dream of being self-employed with freedom and flexibility in the mortgage business is that they lack an effective daily action plan. They just kind of wing it. They fly by the seat of their pants. They figure if I just throw some yogurt at the fan, eventually something's going to stick. They wake up too late. They stay up too late. They wake up too late. They're waking up at like 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Uh, or they wake up early, but what do they do? They go and they check their email. They go and they scroll on social media. They go and they watch or read the news. And so the very first hours of the day are squandered. See, everyone, you, myself, millionaires, billionaires, and people who are living on the streets all have the same gift of 168 hours a day. We have 
We've all been granted that gift by God's grace to have 168 hours a day to do something with. Top producers invest it wisely, low producers squander it. And there's a big difference between activity and productivity. There's a big difference between putting in the time and getting value from the time you're putting in. I'm all about not putting in more time, but getting more from the time you're already putting in. I'm all about working smarter, not harder. To do that, you need a daily action plan. You need a proactive daily action plan where you plan your work, you work your plan, where you start your day off with a bang, with the things that fill your cup and fuel your rocket, that get you feeling fantastic, that gets you feeling on fire, that gets you ready to conquer the day, that gets your vibration and your energy vibrating on a frequency of victory and success and conquering your dreams and gratitude and joy and peace and poise and power. Is your daily agenda infusing your day with that vibration of gratitude, peace, power, and poise? If it's not, chances are you need to retool your daily action plan. Do you have time allocated each day for proactive lead generation? Do you have time allocated each day for, for proactively generating more repeat and referral business from your past client database and for cultivating your existing partners and attracting new ones? Are you honoring your plan? Are you working your plan? It's not enough just to have a plan. You got to work it, right? So that's where a lot of people fail is that they want the glory of, su of success, but they're not willing to inflict them themselves with the, the grind of preparation. The darker, the grinding, the more preparation you do in the dark room of the grind of the daily on the front lines of real life preparation you do, the more you'll shine on the stage of your performance and your public prospering. The more you grind in the darkness of preparation, the more you will shine in the public forum of your being praised and your being prospered on the front lines of you showing up in power because you did the daily preparation. I'm reading a book. Uh, actually, I just finished a book that I think everyone should read. If you guys haven't read it, it's The Mamba Mentality by Kobe Bryant. The late and great just passed away uh, tragically earlier this year. It's been a crazy year indeed in more ways than one. He would work longer and harder than anyone else. While everyone else was just doing two training sessions a day, he did three. How did he do it? He went to bed earlier and he got up earlier. He sacrificed sleep so he could soar. So by getting up at 5 a.m., he could fit three training sessions in a day. Now, that probably won't make a difference in terms of a competitive edge in a day or in a week, but you've got to be knowing you do that day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. He absolutely obliterated his competition and was dominant for 20 years and was the third place for uh, an all-time greats in basketball history as an NBA player behind Karl Malone and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Third place for points with five championships, two most valuable player awards, and finished his last game after 20 years, two decades, with 60 points because he paid the price every freaking day. You can't by success. You rent it and rent is due every freaking day. And that was the Mamba mentality that Kobe Bryant brought because he didn't just have a desire for greatness. He was willing to pay the price for greatness. And a lot of people fall prey to the misconception that just merely wanting to be successful is enough. Everyone wants to be a champion but not everyone's willing to do what it takes to become a champion. Most people have champion level ambitions, but chump level daily routines. And that's the rub. That's why most people fail and fall way short of their 
potential and way short of what they could be and what they want to be. The fifth thing that holds a lot of people back is their lack of effective systems because they come from other lines of work, right? They weren't business people before in many cases. They were teachers, they were selling cars, they were plumbers, they were personal trainers, they were whatever, right? All kinds of different backgrounds that people came from before they got in the mortgage business. And if they didn't have the grace and the favor of mentors, which we're about to talk about in a moment, it's easy to fall prey to just following the herd and doing what everyone else is doing which is essentially building a practice, not building a real business. If you wanna build a real business that sets you free as opposed to a practice that enslaves you, you need to have systems. That's the difference between a practice and a business. A practice, you are the business. You're the chief cook and bottle washer. You're wearing all the hats. The moment you go on vacation, what happens to your business? It falls apart. And that's why so many people that go on vacation in this business and they're not truly on vacation. They're towed around by the electronic leash right? Every single day, they could be and should be hanging with their family playing in the pool, but instead they're on the phone with the electronic leash because they are the business. They don't have a real business. They have a glorified job trading time for money. And that business is not a real business. It's a practice, a practice that enslaves them as opposed to sets them free. But Dorn, I love my work. I love what I do. I don't mind. Yeah. Have you asked your spouse if they mind, if they mind, if they are being interrupted by the phone anytime it might call because you pick up the phone instead of letting it hit voicemail. Do they mind? Do they mind if you're not present for them when they want to be sharing a story or when they want to be going and having quality time with you and you're on your phone being sucked into the vortex of work yet again? Do they mind? You may not mind, but do they mind? And what really matters most? that you love your work such that you're on the phone 24 seven, anytime it calls or anytime it dings, or is it about creating a legendary legacy where you're the best wife, the best husband, the best dad, the best mom. So you can really be an influence and really create a magical life together. How do you create a magical life? If you're constantly being lured away, distracted and derailed and interrupted and not being present, and showing them by virtue of your time that they don't really matter that much because your business takes precedence all day, every day. What is that telling them? I've been there too. It's one of the reasons why I got myself a app for my phone because I was so addicted to scrolling on my phone. I noticed I wasn't being present. And then when my wife would snarl at me about it, I'd pretend I wouldn't do it. I'd, I'd manage, I'd cope. So when she'd come in the room, I'd put my phone away, right? She'd leave the room, I'd pull it out again. And I pretend I'm not on the phone, but really I was. And so I become a coper, coping by managing my you know, addiction, hoping she wouldn't notice. It wasn't until I actually joined a program called Genesis Process. I was leading and facilitating a program at my church called Genesis Process. And I thought I had my shit together, right? Because I'm delusional, delusional optimism. And so I thought, uh, you know, I'm not going to have much to work on. Well, it didn't take long for me to realize I got a real problem. I'm addicted. I'm addicted to scrolling and it's sucking the life out of me and it's sucking the life out of my power to be present for those I love most. And so after literally weeks of me bringing this up in the group and doing nothing about it, one of the guys said, are you going to do something about it or are you just going to talk about it? Because, I mean, if you're just going to talk about it, you know, I'm done with hearing about it. I don't want to hear it anymore. If you're not going to do something about it, I don't want to hear it. That was a kick in the nuts for me. But that's exactly what I needed to hear. That was the tough love I needed to hear. And I finally bucked up and I dropped the $11.95 per month to get an app called Our Pact that allows me to turn my smartphone into a dumb phone after 5 p.m. Monday to Friday and on weekends. So if you're trying to reach out to me after 5 p.m. Pacific time on Monday to Friday or weekends, you're going to notice I don't respond. Why? Because my phone becomes a dumb phone. I can't post anything on social media. I can't receive any messages on social media. But that's one example of a system that allows me to be present for my family, a system that allows me to focus on my work when it's time to work, and then to unplug and be present for my family when it's time to be present with my family. And it wasn't easy, but I realized that 
it's more important for me to stretch myself out of my comfort zone to create the life that I want and the influence and the legacy I want to create versus just doing what's comfortable and convenient versus just following the herd and doing what everyone else does and telling myself the lie, it's not such a big deal. Softening the problem. Oh, it's not such a big deal. Everyone does this. Well, yeah, I can tell myself that and I can be true to that in the sense that I have plenty of references that would give me a, a basis for that belief. But I do want, do I want to be average? Do I want to follow the herd? Do I want to be like everyone else? No, I don't want a mediocre life. I want an extraordinary life. And if we want an extraordinary life, we got to be willing to do what the ordinary aren't willing to do. We've got to be willing to do what most people aren't want to do so we can create the life and the business most people aren't going to create. So systems is a big part of that. Systems for managing our time. Systems for being productive and avoiding being derailed and distracted by the incessant barrage of derailments and disruptions if we let them in. Systems for planning our work and working our plan. Systems for lead generation. Systems for lead conversion. Systems for delegation. Systems for being able to build a business that sets us free, that runs in our absence like a finely oiled machine. Those are all systems. And if you want a business that sets you free, you need to invest time every week in building out those systems. The sixth thing that has mortgage professionals fall short of their potential and causes many to fail is lack of delegating their weaknesses. You see, weaknesses is something we all have. We all have weaknesses. And the problem with that is that if we look at our weaknesses and we focus on our weaknesses and we give energy to our weaknesses, and I struggled that with, with that for a long time. They called me bathroom boy in high school because I was so obsessed and narcissistic about fixing my hair that they would always find me in the bathroom. And of course, I'd pretend that I was there for what bathrooms are used for, going to the bathroom. But... Uh, so, you know, I'd be washing my hands in many cases when people would walk in there. But as soon as they leave, I go right back to priming my hair. That was when I used to have hair. I had this Tia Pet hairdo and I had this presupposition, this erroneous belief that if I can just get my hair just right, if I can just get the curls just right, if I can get everything looking just right, the girls will like me, the dudes will think I'm cool and I'll be a somebody and I'll, be, I'll belong and I'll be accepted. The problem with that is it was never enough because I had this belief that I was not enough such that nothing I did could fill that void. And it wasn't until I had a God encounter at age 19, living in a frat house where God exploded my mind with the truth that he doesn't make any junk and he didn't start with me. And I'm knitting my mother's womb for a special plan and a special purpose. And all of a sudden my heart and my mind got excited and ignited with a new truth that I don't have to do anything or achieve anything or fix anything with myself to have value and worth. And that was a game changer for me. And I've struggled much of my life with this. And my wife will concur with this, with the sense that I have to have it all together. I have to seem like I have it all together. The problem with that is it disconnects us, right? Because if I look like I have it all together, you can't connect with my humanity. And then I feel disconnected and alone trying to cope with my own sense of insecurities and inadequacies. And you feel alienated because you feel like Dorn's got his shit together. I wish I could be like him. Or on the flip side, you say that all that guy talks about is all the things that I should do and all the things that you know I need to do and I never hear his humanity. I never feel connected to them. There's something just not right. There's, and usually it's the insecurity that causes us to disconnect from each other, managing those insecurities. So that caused a rift in my relationship with my wife for many, many years. And it's still something, frankly, that I struggle with, this sense of uh, having a hard time receiving feedback because I have to have it all together. It's not trying to fix our weaknesses either. It's about embracing what we are, embracing what we're not. The eagle is not meant to be a chicken. The eagle is meant to be an eagle. And the chicken is not meant to be an eagle. 
the chicken's meant to be a chicken. So they all have uniqueness ordained by God. And there's nothing wrong with what they are or what they're not. They just are. And so embracing our strengths and also embracing our weaknesses is the first step to fully leveraging our strengths. And I got to the point where I actually journaled and wrote down like 12 things that are my strengths and then like 20 things that are my weaknesses. And I got to the point where it was okay to have those weaknesses. I didn't beat myself up. I didn't judge. I didn't criticize. It just was. It's like, that's just the way God made me. I'm not into doing paperwork. I'm not into the mindless minutia, the mundane minutia of administration. That's just not my thing. I love to lead. I love to coach. I love to speak. I love to create content. I love to help people create breakthroughs. I love to be creative. I love to be a visionary. To me, that's what ignites me and excites me. And so tapping your full potential is about getting real with your weaknesses so that you can delegate your weaknesses so that you can dance in your strengths, dancing in your zone of genius, dancing in your unique abilities, dancing in what lights your fire, dancing in what has you have pep in your step and sparkle in your eye. Dancing in the things that has you transcend time and space because you just love it so much. You just get caught in the moment. You get caught up in flow. I've been talking for 47 minutes right now. I didn't even know what the heck I was really going to be talking about. I'm just on the fly. I don't have a script. But when you're dancing in the moment, using your gifts and talents to serve your fellow man, you lose sight of time and space. You do it even if you're not getting paid for it because it lights your fire. It ignites you and excites you. Now, if all I did all day, every day was do paperwork, I'd be miserable. I would be absolutely be miserable. It gives me a thumper just thinking about it. Far too often, we get bogged down in our weaknesses, trying to hem up our weaknesses, trying to improve our weaknesses, trying to get better at our weaknesses. Could you imagine if an eagle, instead of spreading his wings and soaring, was working on try to trying to pick grubs out of the yard because he's just not as good at picking grubs out of the yard like the chickens are. Could you imagine if he, you know, felt sorry for himself and felt inadequate because he just can't get his grub picking together like all those chickens? What if he wasn't meant to pick freaking grubs from the yard? What if he was meant to soar and grab fresh, alive, and wild salmon out of the river? What if that was his gift? What What if that was his calling? And yet if he made himself, you know, feel like he's inadequate because he, he's not very good at being a grub picker, imagine how that would steal the joy of what he's truly called to be, to soar like an eagle. So delegating weaknesses is about liberating you to dance in your strengths. It's not about neglect. It's not about, oh, he just doesn't like doing that, you know. He, he, he doesn't like, he's lazy. No, he's not lazy. He wants to be using his gifts for God's glory, for other people's good and for his own joy to serve humanity at the highest and to fulfill his fullest potential by dancing in his strengths. That's why he's delegating his weaknesses. Far too often, we think that delegating our weaknesses is an option. It's a luxury. Like, If I can just eventually get to that certain level, then I'll delegate. Screw freaking that. You can start delegating for five bucks an hour to the Philippines with a virtual assistant. You can start delegating your paperwork. You can start delegating your bookkeeping. You start delegating those low level tasks because if you want to make $100,000 a year, your time needs to be worth 50 bucks an hour. You want to make a million dollars a year, your time needs to be worth $500 an hour. And if you're doing stuff, you can delegate for five to 15 bucks an hour. We got a problem. Your income's going to drop accordingly, and you're going to feel like your battery is being sucked, and someone just sunk their their vampire, you know, teeth right into your neck, sucking you dry because you're doing stuff you hate doing. Stop it! Do stuff that you love doing. Life is too short to operate in your weaknesses when you can be dancing in your strengths. And lastly, the seventh thing that holds people back from greatness, the seventh thing that holds people back from success and causing causes them to fail and to not tap their full potential is lack of effective mentoring. And I did this for the longest time, you know, 
I'd read a few books, but even the books I read, they didn't captivate me. It was like grinding through the mud with concrete blocks on my feet just to read the book because it wasn't something I was super interested in. The topic of success was interesting to me, but the way it was written was just dry and dull. And it was like trying to suck mud through a straw. It was just so hard. And I often made this excuse. Oh, I can't afford to have a coach. I can't afford to have a mentor. I can't afford to have someone, you know, to teach me how to do this because I'm bootstrapping it. And so I would just keep winging it, flying by the seat of my pants, grinding, white knuckling, trying to work longer and harder, trying to cope with my hamstrung weaknesses and my Achilles heels and never really realizing that The reason why I'm struggling is because I'm trying to reinvent the wheel. The reason I'm struggling is because I'm being such a cheap ass and not investing in myself. The reason I'm struggling is because I'm trying to reinvent the recipe instead of just grabbing the recipe from the master chef. One of the fastest ways to accelerate your success is to invest in a proven recipe. As good old Benny Franklin once said, for the best return on your money, pour your purse into your head. In other words, for the best return on your money, Invest in yourself, invest in someone who's gone the distance before you, who's got the systems and has got the results that you've wanted, that you've been wanting to get. So you can bypass all the trouble and struggle of trying to reinvent the wheel and just get straight to what works. If you want to make a souffle, you can try and reinvent the wheel and try and figure out on the fly what a souffle might be uh, made of and what temperature the oven should be and what order the ingredients should go in the, the bowl with and how many times and how long you're supposed to stir it. Or you can just get a master chef recipe of a souffle and bada, bada boom, you got a kick ass, beautiful, delicious souffle on your first attempt. That's the power of having a proven recipe. That's how you tap your full potential. Not continuing to bang your head against the wall, doing it the hard way. As the old going, the old, the old saying goes, if you keep doing what you've always been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And so often that's what happens is we just keep slinging yogurt to the fan, hoping something sticks and wonder why it ain't working. Wonder no longer. It's because A, you don't have the right mentor or B, You've got the mentor, but you're not being coachable. You've got to be willing to empty your cup so we can fill it with your dream. If your cup's already full and you have already already all the answers, well, then there's not a whole lot we can do for you. You know, you can lead a whole horse to water, but you can't force it to what? Can't force it to drink. That's why I only work with thirsty horses. Those who realize their way ain't working, they're done doing it the hard way. They're ready to empty their cup so we can fill it with their dream. They're just done with doing it the hard way. So if that's you, my friends, and you're picking up what I'm laying down and you're noticing that either one or more of these seven speed bumps to success, these seven landmines to success have been a thwarting point in your life and your business, and you're ready to blast through those thwarting points like paper walls, just blast right through them. You're ready to go stratospheric and step into your greatness, step into your power, step into fulfillment and freedom like never before, then I invite you to take advantage of a complimentary breakthrough call. Now, this is only for residential mortgage professionals who have 80 basis points or higher comp plan, who are wanting to at least add an extra $100,000 to their income in additional commissions and who are sick and tired of doing it the way you're doing it and getting it the way you're getting it, and you're ready to create a breakthrough in your life, not just a small incremental improvement, but double, triple, quadruple your income, I invite you to take advantage of a complimentary breakthrough call where you get on the phone with me or one of my consultants where we lift up the hood on your business, we look at what's working, what's not working, where you're at now, where you want to be, And if we can help you create a breakthrough in your business, by all means, we will show you how to do that. We'll show you what that looks like. If not, we'll be the very first people to advise you to pass on our services. Either way, you'll leave the call with massive clarity, clarity like you've never had before, massive value, and chances are we'll have some fun along the way. So if that sounds meaningful and worthwhile to you, you'd like to take advantage of that since it's 100% complimentary, no strings attached, our gift from our hearts to yours, then go ahead and book the call, mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. So thanks for hanging with me, guys. 
I trust you got some value, some clarity, some insight from the time we've had together today. This is Dorn Aldana from MortgageMarketingCoach.com coming at you from the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. Be blessed. Go out there, step into your greatness, step into your power, and step into a big, hairy, audacious dream. Don't ask yourself, what am I worthy of? Don't ask yourself, what goal am I worthy of? Don't ask yourself, what partners am I worthy of? Don't ask yourself, what clients am I worthy of? Instead, ask, what is worthy of me? What dream is worthy of my time, my talent, my gift? What partners are worthy of me and the gift I have to bring? What clients are worthy of me and the gift I have to bring to the world? Don't ask who is going to be you know, part of your world from a standpoint of insufficiency and lack, but instead flip the script and know that you're designed for greatness. You're designed by greatness and you're designed for greatness. Be blessed. We'll talk to you again soon. Peace.